I'm uh, Chris Mollick from Cleveland Clinic and moderating this session along with uh, Dr. Backrack and Dr. Cummins. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started a little bit later here. Uh, first talk is on my approach uh, to uh, deciding open versus endovascular repair for uh, AAA. And these are my disclosures. Um, so we, we know the options. Uh, big open surgery versus EVAR, which we used to do kind of in somewhat smaller incisions, but now has, has kind of converted to this needle, poke, and Band-Aid surgery. So at first glance, you know, it seems obvious, but I think it's important to remember uh, that aneurysmal disease is progressive and chronic, and I think uh, Dr. Greenberg used to put this forth uh, during all of his talks. It affects the aortic wall at different times throughout the patient's life, and we really have to plan for the future with this, whether it's going to be an, an open approach, an endovascular approach, or a hybrid approach. This is just another example of a, a typical infrarenal stent graft done back in 2003, and you can see over the years that that proximal stent and neck has dilated and needed to be converted with a FEBAR. So we really like to look at these um, with a centerline approach, no, no matter uh, what our operative or interventional approach will be. This is a patient who migrated to us, and you can see down here the, at the lower aspect, this uh, stent graft was put in a, a the guy who's 61 when he presented to us that was put in somewhat in his early to mid-50s, and either you know his aorta de degenerated or it just wasn't noticed that he had already had aneurysmal disease throughout his entire aorta, you could see up into the arch. And so that's, that stent graft, as you can see there, is really serving no purpose. And these are just some other pictures uh, demonstrating that. So how do we avoid this? Well, I, this may seem obvious, but I think far too often we do stray off of the IFU. And so one of the first determining factors in you know endo versus open for me is, you know, will this patient fit into the, I, into the IFU, and we really are stringent about sticking to it. Why? Because all the money, the years of testing that's put into this, you know, you really have the, the, the backup, and when you treat the patients on the label, you do have the weight of those years of testing behind you to support it. And, you know, this is a little bit of an older uh, picture, so now we do have devices that treat uh, even in, in trial um, or four millimeters if, if we, you know, count the fenestrated off the, uh, device that is uh, commercially available, but even seven and 13 millimeter devices and treating different angle necks. But the, the point is, you know, these things are laid out in each one of those devices and I do recommend that we stick to it. So this was looked at a few years ago in 2011, uh, in the Shanzer paper that was in circulation and they looked at a multi-center po patient population the compliance with the published EVAR device IFU guidelines was low, and therefore their post-EVAR aneurysm sac enlargement was high. Just looking at one uh, graph from that paper, th this actually appears to have uh, gotten worse over time. So as there was more experience with EVAR in the later years, the uh, percent uh, without enlargement continued to, to go down. And that probably was due to straying uh, from the IFU with uh, familiarity with the procedure and with the device. So we know the vulnerable aorta basically can summarize all four of the, of the components of the vulnerable aorta or the four horsemen of the aorta with uh, calling them parallel walled. You really need a parallel walled um, aorta after sticking to all the other uh, IFUs specific to each device tortuosity, calcification, thrombus, and irregularity uh, are really to the, to the detriment of the device. And this uh, sort of recent paper from 2012 looked at the long-term freedom from intervention in favorable and hostile necks, and not surprisingly, the, the hostile neck had a, a lower percentage of those surviving without a re-intervention. So easy enough sticking to the IFU, but there are additional modes of failure within the IFU. So we, st we stay on it, but there may still be some people who we don't m want to treat, and that may come down to age. If we look at the forces that are at work in the aorta, you know, the, these are, this is the whole reason why we repair them at a certain point when the, the, the sac pressure is going to rupture. But we transfer those forces to the proximal and distal sealing zones of, of the graft. And most of the commercially available grafts now are fixed in those areas with uh, extrinsic radial force. That over time, whatever 
and I, we talked about this in the live session just earlier, kind of whatever size that self-expanding stent uh, is, is nominally, it's going to push out to that over time and want to reach that size. It's going to push against the aortic wall and you know, continue those stresses in those areas. And it's interesting to hear some of my senior partners talk about this when they were <clears throat> around sort of the advent with, with um, Shooter and Greenberg kind of bringing these things uh, into the United States and saying, having arguments with, the, with their senior partners of how are you going to fix a problem of extrinsic radial force with further extrinsic radial force. And this is exactly what they were talking about. So I'm not going to delve into each one of these papers, but even going back to 2002 in the JVS, um, it, it was noted that over time these uh, <clears throat> devices with extrinsic radial force will dilate the aortic neck. Contrast that to uh, excuse me, let me go back here. Contrast that to uh, some of these papers similar to Dr. Perotti's, who, if you recall, in the first EVAR, this was with he and Paul Maz, was done with a Paul Maz stent, a balloon expanding stent, an expandable stent. Uh, there was an absence of proximal neck dilation, uh, either static or it got smaller, but definitely did not expand. One interesting paper from our institution a few years back looked at uh, zenith graphs where there was not a good proximal seal during the case. A large palma stent was used, uh, balloon expandable stent, to, to oppose and, and get rid of the type 1 endoleak. And what you see here is when they look back at these patients after a few years, you see the self-expanding stent has grown. The balloon expandable stent has stayed the same. That self-expanding stent has contributed, at least in part, to the, to the degeneration of the neck over time. So this was shown, as I'm sure many are aware, in the, in the, uh, the DREAM trial, the EVAR trial, uh, endovascular repair, and similarly matched patients with open repair uh, have a lower percentage of surviving without a reintervention. Just as recent as 2015 in the New England Journal, looking at the Medicare population, these big databases, it's hard to uh, get down to the granular level, of course, of a, of a prospective randomized trial like EVAR one and dream, but you can see some major events and they really found that the, the rate of late rupture was significantly higher after endovascular repair rather than open, even though they did account for more uh, interventions in the, in, the open case, in the open patients that weren't actually seen otherwise. So how do we improve EVAR durability? Parallel walled landing zone, begin with the end in mind. Aware of younger patients, and I think that's probably the biggest take home. They may not have a diagnosed connective tissue disorder, but they're probably going to live for a while. They don't have the same comorbidities as our older patients, and they certainly have a longer life ahead of them. Um, if you're worried about the extent of repair, stage it. And as my former partner, Dr. Mastracci, said once, um, obey the spandex pants rule. Just because it fits doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. So looking at your institution and your resources, um, high volume centers, uh, that do a lot of different aortic surgery, um, you know, and, and we do up to close to 100 per year, at, uh, just a, um, infrarenal and juxtarenal aortas. Most programs are doing about 10 or so. You know, you can really, by getting the whole team, the ICU, the operating room, you can get those aortic complications down, sometimes to zero for a few years, and really have that as another option for you for your younger patients. Um, what it has led to with, uh, I think, you know, either abusing the IFU or putting them in, in smaller patients, exclusive of those that become infected, has led to a, a large number of EVAR explants, which we've written about recently. And we're a little pressed for time, so I'll go through this, but it ends up for a complex operation, and these are going up by the year. So, and we think sometimes we may be, may be saving a patient from an open operation and the comorbidities, but we may just be buying them an even larger open operation, uh, more dangerous, more comorbidities in the future. So, uh, my decision tree goes, you know, uh, a, young, <clears throat> a young and healthy patient with good anatomy and uh, otherwise healthy, I, I kind of lean toward open. I do give them the choice, but we have to have a long conversation about that. If it's a young, healthy patient with difficult anatomy for an EVAR, then the choice is also easy for open. Same for uh, EVAR for the sick <clears throat> with easy anatomy. And then 
you know, we, we, we do start to stretch the IFU or, you know, research devices, uh, fenestrated devices uh, for the uh, old sick patients with the difficult anatomy. Obesity plays into this in some ways. I know there probably would be some argument about that. So think about eight to 10 years of EVAR durability. Think about patients that are age 70 and healthy in that regard um, that may be good candidates for open. They spend a week in the hospital but uh, with an ICU stay, but then we see them in a month and then not have to see them for three to five years if you do a good repair and evaluate the entire aorta. Maybe a you know, maybe the occasional CT, but can do them with duplex, versus a young patient who may spend a day in the hospital, may even be an outpatient procedure, but one month, six month, and every year follow up with a CTA, the higher risk of more procedures, more contrast, more radiation over the span of 10, 15, or even longer. Just something to, to think about when choosing between the two. Um, so we know what to do to prevent a rupture. Uh, in conclusion, we look at the EVAR, the open successes, benefits, and the differences. Um, the WHO, the, the decisions based on anatomy, physiologic status. Although we are advancing uh, the, the uh, upper limits of EVAR, and we do have to, have to ride that of, of still pushing. Um, it's going to go in that direction, I'm sure, eventually, but uh, we still need to maintain uh, good open skills and, and WHO is, is a good candidate for open. And then, uh, of course, the results are dependent on comorbidities and experience. And also, last but not least, consider no repair for those uh, whose comorbidity uh, and death rate is greater than the rupture risk. So thank you. I'm sorry I, I rushed through that. Um,